Edinburgh, Queen Elizabeth's northern capital prepares to greet Her Majesty. From the royal train, she steps onto the platform at Prince's Street Station, where the Lord Provost, Sir James Miller, offers the keys of the city as a token of Edinburgh's loyal welcome. Accompanying the Queen is the Duke of Edinburgh. Outside, a huge crowd waits to greet the Queen, as escorted by her traditional guardians, the household cavalry, she rides through the streets towards her Scottish home, Holyrood House. Four Windsor Greys draw the royal coach past the cheering thousands. The coach arrives at Holyrood House, where Her Majesty will take up residence during her stay in Scotland. Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders in full dress uniform, who mount the Guard of Honour, are inspected by the Queen. Many of these men have just returned from Korea, where they fought with the gallantry that is a tradition of this famous regiment. The regiment's pony mascot, Kruachan, comes in for special attention from the Queen. The following day, the great city is the scene of majestic splendor. From the ancient castle have been taken the royal regalia to join the magnificent procession that journeys along Prince's Street, accompanying Her Majesty to a service of national thanksgiving at St. Giles Cathedral. Born in public for the first time since 1822 are the crown, the scepter and the sword, Scotland's proud emblems of majesty. The regalia are carried in the procession at the express wish of Her Majesty the Queen. Past cheering crowds, many of whom have waited for this moment since dawn, the Queen drives and Scotsmen recall with pride that it is from their capital that her husband takes his royal title. coach turns towards the great cathedral. Already more than 1,700 people from all walks of life have gathered within to welcome their crowned and anointed queen. In procession come peers of the realm and civic dignitaries to join the congregation. Her Majesty and the Duke, who wears Field Marshal's uniform, arrive at St. Giles. The bearers of the regalia wait to join the procession into the cathedral. The dean of the chapel royal, who is minister of St. Giles, is to conduct the service. The crown is carried before Her Majesty and the Duke. Within the cathedral, where so much of Scotland's glorious history is recalled in heraldic emblems, the Queen and the Duke take up their positions in the royal pew. The crown is placed upon the altar. On either side rest the sword and the scepter. For centuries, these honors of Scotland have survived, guarded throughout the wars that have threatened to ravage the nation. During the service, they will be offered to the young queen as a demonstration of the loyalty of her Scottish subjects. Her Majesty is blessed by the Dean of the Thistle and Chapel Royal. The blessing is that used at her coronation. Now, the congregation join in the national anthem. The honours of Scotland are handed severally to the Queen. The sword of state is returned by Her Majesty to the bearer Lord Hume, who is deputising for the Lord High Constable Lady Errol. Now the Scottish crown is offered to the Queen.
The Duke of Hamilton and Brandon, as holder of the Earldom of Angus, receives the crown from the Queen. The solemn service of thanksgiving and dedication ends. And preceded by the regalia, Her Majesty moves towards the west door. The crowds press forward as the royal couple prepare to journey through the city again. Later in the afternoon, crowds gather outside Holyrood House for the Royal Garden Party. More than 9,000 guests have been invited. The Duke of Edinburgh, who wears morning dress, walks among the guests chatting informally with many of them. The grey clouds of the morning have rolled away, and now a bright sun shines through. Her Majesty spends more than an hour and a half talking with her guests. From the slopes leading to Arthur's seat, thousands look down upon the happy scene within the palace grounds. Among those present is a group of colonial students. Already within the first days of her visit, the Queen has further endeared herself to all her Scottish subjects. On the third day of the royal visit, the Queen and the Duke drive to Hampden Park to attend a youth rally. More than 20 youth organizations have cooperated in staging the display as their tribute to Her Majesty. From the royal box, the Queen watches the rally begin. 2,000 children between the ages of 11 and 18 take part. There's no doubt about their loyalty. The Duke claps his congratulations as the royal car drives away from Hampden Park after the display. The Scottish Veterans Garden City at Penelie is another place visited by the royal couple. The ex-servicemen and their wives, who occupy the 40 houses, contributed to a bouquet presented by six-year-old Wilma Stafford. The Queen chats with many of the veterans and inspects their houses and meets some of the tenants. Sir Alex King accompanies the Duke as Pinelli's royal visitors leave to continue their tour. Outside Glasgow city chambers, an enormous crowd gathers to cheer Her Majesty on arrival. The Lord Provost, Mr. Kerr, welcomes the Queen and the Duke to the city. Despite police cordons, the crowds in George Square threaten to break through. Her Majesty, escorted by Major General Collingwood, inspects men of the Scots Guards who form the Guard of Honor. As the Queen comes near the crowd, they surge forward again. Many who faint in the crush are trampled underfoot, despite every effort of police. The Queen remains calm as she walks back towards the city chambers. About 300 people have been hurt. At last, the crowds are controlled as Her Majesty and the Duke come onto the balcony to acknowledge their cheers. The people of Glasgow sum up the affection all Scotland holds for its young and gracious Queen. <laughs> 